Krakow, a city 1,000 years old in the south of Poland. In Jewish tradition, it is called Kruke. From 1138, Krakow was the capital of the kings of Poland. They established their residence in the glorious Wawel Palace, which dominates the entire city. In the late 1930s, the American Jewish charity organizations are sending filming crews to Poland in order to document Jewish life. This particular film was recorded in 1939. Yes, the first medieval Jewish community was located in the very city center of Krakow already in 1200s. From 1300s, the second Jewish community grows in the nearby Kazimierz, based on the refugees from Germany and Prague. Very soon, the Krakow Jews will be forced to live in the village of Kazimierz, not far from Krakow. Until the middle of the 19th century, the Jews of Krakow continued to live in cramped quarters in Kazimierz. Welcome to Krakow, or actually, welcome to its Jewish district of Kazimierz. It's one of the most unique Jewish districts in the world. Not because I'm talking from here today, not because I'm local, I'm a Krakowian, because of history. Kazimierz is almost the one and only coherently preserved medieval Jewish district still existing in this planet. Yes, we are talking about a medieval part of Krakow, which was started in 1300. And this is pretty much also the time when the Jewish history dates back here, around 12-1300s, when mostly Germanic Jews were escaping Western Europe and moving into the territories of Central Europe. When they came, they built the first synagogue. They were not allowed to build a synagogue in the very city center of Krakow, so they had to stay within a certain city outskirts, a district which uh, is being developed as an independent city of Kazimierz. Later on in time, Kazimierz will be, of course, merged and morphed to the city itself. Uh, but when we come back to the medieval history in uh, 1300s, it was an independent city. It was surrounded with city walls, which you can see right now behind me. And uh, in 1300s, as the community built up based on those Jews coming from Germany, later on also Czech Republic, Prague, uh, there is a need for a religious building. There's a need for a synagogue and it is built. The wall is adjacent to a magnificent 1300 structure, which is making the old synagogue in Kazimierz, one of seven one of seven existing, still-standing synagogues, ranging from 1300s, as the old synagogue behind me, all the way into the 20th century. Synagogues and shtibels, small prayer houses, which were dotting the landscape. Well, a very rich Jewish religious life is developed in Kazimierz, because in 1939, when the war starts, there is around 64,000 of Jews in Krakow, making about 25% of the city population. When you look at the map of this district, you can very clearly see this is the district of Kazimierz right now. We are standing somewhere next to the Synagoga Stara, somewhere next to the old synagogue. In front of us is the Szeroka Street, the Broad Street, which for centuries was the very center of Jewish life. And in this rather small piece of land, you can see seven markers showing you the still standing historical synagogues of Krakow. Uh, all of them available, all of them to be visited, uh, all of them becoming a marker of time and a marker of communal development. In the 19th century, the village became a part of Krakow and from 1867, Jews were again permitted to live in any part of Greater Krakow. Nevertheless, a considerable portion of the Jewish population, which numbers 60,000 souls, lives to this day in Kazimierz, which the Jews call Kuzmir. Behind me is the already legendary Szeroka Street, the Broadway, which became the cradle of Krakow Jewish life. When we talk about the beginnings of the city, and uh, every city starts with uh, 
the decision about the size and shape of a market square, yes, the cities were nothing more in medieval time period as large merchandising centers on the convenient crossroads. Uh, so every city starts with uh, shaping of a market square. In case of Kazimierz, there are a couple of those squares. There's definitely Volnica Square, which is taking more of a rectangular form. But uh, Szeroka Street, the Broadway, from pretty much 1300s up until World War II, remained a major Jewish market square in the district of Kazimierz. This is a poor district, but many of the richer Jews prefer to live here and be close to the communal institutions and the old synagogues. Rebbe Isaac Shul was built at the beginning of the 17th century by Rabbi Yitzhak Yekalish, head of the Jewish community. A synagogue built in the 16th century bears the name of the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, one of the great codifiers in the history of Judaism. Here he composed the Mapa, or the tablecloth, to complement the Shulchan Aruch of Rabbi Yosef Karo from Safed and to adapt it to the customs of Ashkenazi Jewry. The old cemetery next to the synagogue named after the Ramah. Here are buried great rabbis of the period. Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller, the great Talmudist rabbi Yaakov Polak, the Kabbalist rabbi Natan Neta Shapira, and many others. On Lagba Omer, the anniversary of the Ramah's death, thousands of Jews come from all over Poland to prostrate themselves upon his grave. Welcome to the Ramah Jewish Cemetery in Krakow, one of the oldest Jewish cemeteries in this part of the world. Among the oldest in Europe, that's for sure, it dates back to the first half of 1500s and is named after an outstanding Talmudic scholar, Moshe Israelis, better known by the first letters taken from his writings, creating an acronym of Ramah. Such is the name of the cemetery itself, and such is the name of the adjacent synagogue. The synagogue, interestingly enough, was built based on the private property belonging to the father of Moshe Israelis. Uh, in the excavations of the last five years, we've actually unearthed a warehouse because the father of Moshe Israelis was a pretty outstanding and successful merchant in his times. But returning to Moshe Israelis himself, he studied in Lublin, in the famous Lublin Yeshiva under Shalom Shachna. He returned to Krakow somewhere around mid 1500s and became the renowned, one of the best known European legal authorities on interpretation of Talmud and Torah. Welcome to the new square in Krakow. Before the war, it was also known in the city as a Jewish square. Yes, Europe and its market squares. Krakow has them plenty. A part of the central one, there are many additional smaller markets. But such is also the case of Kazimierz, a part of the main city square, because Kazimierz was established as an independent city in the early medieval time period. So a part of its central square, it also has many additional squares, which were of course used for the same purpose, for trading. But trading for centuries meant meeting, meant talking, meant negotiating, meant seeing otherness, experiencing otherness. In my opinion, for centuries, the role of medieval market squares was a certain security fuse in the society. Yes, this was the place where you had your opportunity of uh, experiencing the other, the other ethnicity, the other skin color, the other culture, the other religion. And 
in spite of all possible uh, interpretations that you might have heard in the church or elsewhere about those other people and their role, at the end of the day you were coming down here to buy, to negotiate, to trade, to have a small talk. Yes, people engage in small talks and in such way they normalize their relations. Not far from there stands the temple, a new synagogue, where the Zionist leader, Dr. Yehoshua Ton, delivers the sermons. where we lived. Before the war, Miodova Street was a street of intellectual, secular Jews. The ones with side locks, the religious ones, they walked along it because it was a main street, but they didn't live there. We had a very nice apartment, eight rooms on the second floor. My brother, Enrique, had his own room. I had mine. The children's maid had her own room too. We were well off, no, not potentates. The father was the sort of person that whatever had just come out, he had to buy. The first radio with a magic eye, a wind-up gramophone and beautiful records. I went to a state elementary school. That school is still there, on Staro Vishlana Street, on the corner of Miodova Street, this big red school, Dr. Hilfstein's Gymnasium. Around the fifth grade, I became a pupil at the Dr. Hilfstein Hebrew Gymnasium, a beautiful school on Pobrzeża Street. Very high standards. All the subjects were taught in Polish and there was also Hebrew. There were only Jewish children, but well-off ones. The school had a huge courtyard and a wonderful gymnastics hall. Opposite our house was Temple Synagogue. Before the war, it was a reform synagogue for wealthier people who would come in cars and carriages. An Orthodox Jew wouldn't have gone in there. My parents always went to synagogue for every holiday. And sometimes, when Father went with Mother on a Saturday, they would take me temple was beautiful. The men were downstairs and the women upstairs and I used to go with Mama up these stairs. There was a barrier there and you looked down at what the men were doing and how they prayed. That all delighted me. A gunshot on Miodova. This is the only picture I have of my mother. She's in the centre. She was a stay-at-home kind of person. In December 1939, I came home from school one day and the janitor stopped me at our front door. She said, Tosia, you haven't got a mummy anymore. Mama had been shot at home by Germans who were taking away the furniture. She tried to stop them and... and they just shot her. We still had our things when we went into the Podgorja ghetto and there they allocated one room to three or four families divided by wardrobes. I slept behind one wardrobe, along with father and my brother, 
another family has slept behind another wardrobe and, well, that's how we lived. Later, when the ghetto was liquidated on March the 13th, 1943, they ordered us to gather on the square where the pharmacy was, which was now a museum. This pharmacy was run by a Pole, Tadeusz Pankiewicz, who became a righteous among the nations. You were allowed to take with you as much as you could carry. So poor father, he dressed me up like an onion in layers because that was how I could carry the most. There were trucks standing on Zgodi Square and the Germans very politely told us to write our names on our suitcases and load them onto the trucks. They said that we would get everything back in Plasho. I wasn't in Plasho for long because I was taken to the Emile Baron Fabric in Zabwacha, number four, Wilpover Street. I had it very good at Schindler's because he made enormous efforts to make sure that we had food. Apart from that, we were working with Poles, and if you knew anybody, they would pass on letters for you. And they brought us bread rolls. If anybody had anything to sell, they would sell it and bring us something else for the money. They helped a lot. Kazimierz, after World War II, became a district with almost no Jewish population. From 64,000 of Jews that lived in Krakow before the war, there were only a couple of thousands of survivors. Of those, only a couple of hundreds decided to stay in the rather gruesome reality of after-war communism Poland. So after the war, most of the sites belonging to the 64,000 of Krakow Jews before the war, most of the communal sites were reclaimed and put into certain order. Some of the synagogues were restored into their religious functions to serve as those couple of hundreds of Jewish survivors that decided to stay in Krakow after the war finished. It was very hard to be Jewish, especially that it was a time when one German Nazi totalitarian system is swiftly changed by the Soviet communist system. The Ramad Jewish cemetery was very badly vandalized in World War II. And right after the war, the survivors decided to take care of the Jewish historical sites, decided to re-establish synagogues. Ironically, all of the synagogues of Kazimierz, all seven of the established synagogues, plus a certain number of shtibels, of which there were hundreds before the war, survived the German Nazi occupation. The irony is, the city of Krakow was changed by the German Nazis into their administrative headquarters of occupation of Poland, of destruction of Krakow, but also Polish Jewry as such. Krakow was gradually Germanized and was to be changed into kind of an iconic new German city in the, in the East without any Jewish presence, but also without any traces of Jewish presence ever here in the past. But ironically, the entire Jewish district of Kazimierz, physically, with architecture, structures and synagogues, survived.
after the war, the survivors were picking up the pieces. Yes, they were picking up the pieces of their pre-war lives. They were picking up the pieces of their family members that might have survived but are scattered all over the European continent at this point. They are also picking up the pieces of uh, Jewish life that used to be here before the war started. In case of the Rima Cemetery, it was very literal. In the 50s, there was an excavation organized at the Rima Jewish Cemetery in order to pick up the pieces, to reclaim the stones and the pieces of stones that were buried underneath in the under cemetery layers for centuries. Some of those stones that were not damaged were re-established in the cemetery, creating a certain kind of a lapidarium. All of those that were fractured, damaged, destroyed, were decided to be put into this commemorative wall which is behind me. Almost immediately this wall was being given the name of Krakow Wailing Wall and almost immediately at the time when the memory is only starting to form in the 40s and 50s this wall was understood as the first initial monument to the Holocaust, a first initial monument to the destruction that happened. There are a few reasons why Kazimierz is, is so unique and brings so many people from all over the world. Um, first of all, it has not been destroyed. So what we have here is the original fabric of the town that was created throughout the centuries. So that's one unique feature that whatever you see here, this is pretty much unique uh, and original. Um, second of all, Kazimierz history is unique. It was created, uh, a part of it was created as a Jewish town. So we know that in the history, usually the story is that there are towns and cities where the Jews are not allowed to settle. In Kazimierz the story was very different. It was the part of the city that where Christians were not allowed to settle by the orders of, of the king. So the space that was uniquely created for the Jews was created here when the Jews were uh, expelled from, um, especially in the end of uh, 15th century, expelled from uh, the city of Krakow. When you look at the um, Jewish uh, heritage here, certainly uh, Kazimierz was unique because of uh, being Ashkenazi Jewish life center and this is something that make, made it unique in the so-called golden age uh, in the 16th and 17th century but uh, today we see the both uh, intellectual and material heritage of this golden period which is uh, to some extent uh, carried on by the community in the later period but uh, to some extent it's also forgotten or maybe not appreciated enough. So certainly this is one of the elements of Kashmir that was unique and is unique today and we need to uh, think about it a little bit more carefully and uh, try to uh, protect it. Kashmir is absolutely unique place for Jewish studies, for uh, the research on the history of Krakowian Jewry. Um, you basically should not stay in the classroom. You should walk around Kashmir and teach about the history of uh, uh, Krakowian jewelry at the sites when the history happened and that's unique and sometimes if you're lucky you can also teach history uh, talking to the witnesses or uh, the survivors so that's unique because Kashmir it's not just the material infrastructure it's also people uh, people who lived here people who live here today uh, and we see them uh, around and uh, that also touches uh, um, on another issue which is uh, Kazimierz it's not just the past it's also today it's also the contemporary Jewish life which is unique when you look at the historical districts around uh, Europe very often there is only history, but there is no uh, contemporary life. In Kazimierz, we have both. We have the history and we have the present. Very often, uh, people visiting Kazimierz those days are more interested in the sites and places which are secondarily created to be famous by the film industry rather than exploring the original prime history that happened here. Or maybe those places that are secondarily reproduced on the films 
are helping the visitors and helping the tourists to return mentally and memory-wise to the people that lived in Kazimierz pretty much from medieval time period all the way into 1942 and three. The Jews hurry to the prayer houses in silken capotas, their heads crowned with strimalach. This is how they go to Sabbath prayers. Gichabas, Gichabas, 